truth, I tend your word. Your praise will sound from shore to shore. Till sun shall rise and set no Hey, my name is Chris. I want to welcome you guys tonight for worship. Thank you guys so much for showing up. Uh, it's a little crowded, so would you guys please scoot in? I'm joking. It's okay. Sinner, skip church. Um, let me call us to worship real quick. Um, one of the things I want to just briefly talk about is just God real quick. And uh, God is the most generous being in all of creation. And uh, what I love about God is because he is incredibly giving, he's incredibly filled with joy. Think about what you've received from God. You've received his spirit. You received his word. We've just been uh, acceptance into all of eternity because of what Christ has done for us. And um, one of the things we're going to talk about today is the way that God gives us gifts to build up the body of Christ. And uh, uh, I want to tell a quick story about my boy Walt. Walt was 80 years old when I met him in a small town in northeast Nebraska. He was losing his eyesight, didn't have any money, and was living alone. And I met him at a high school uh, retreat. And somehow he had come in to see his grandkids get involved in this retreat. And he saw me give my testimony. He said, Chris, I just want to uh, write you a letter once a month with ways that I'm praying for you and uh, things that the Lord is teaching me. So once a month, all throughout college, I got a letter from uh, Walt. And I'll never forget him. And uh, that was his gift. See, he is a guy that had been touched by the grace of Jesus Christ, and he said, listen, all of my life I'm going to give my time, talent, and resources away for the kingdom of God. And he finished strong, and he gave uh, into the last season of his life. And I learned so much from Walt, one letter at a time. And so, uh, City Light Church, let's worship that God is a God that not only has saved us for himself, but saved us with a purpose and given us gifts to serve him and build the body of Christ up. Amen? Hey, can I give one last word? We're a little small tonight, but uh, we need to get hyped, and you need to get your amen meter way up, okay? Because I'm not about to have this be the lame, lame service tonight, okay? So step your game up. Let's get it right. <laughs> Oh, uh -huh. 
into your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Oh, light of the world forever. You are more, you are more than my words will ever say. You are Lord, you are Lord. All creation will proclaim. You are here. As my soul arrives, shake off your guilty fears. The bleeding sacrifice in my behalf appears. He ever lives above for me to intercede. His all redeeming love, his precious blood to bleed. Before the throne. Before the throne, my Savior stands. His blood atone, His blood atone for sinful man.
our bleeding wounds he bears received on Calvary. They pour effectual praise, they strongly plead for me. The Father hears him pray, his dear anointed one. He cannot turn away the presence of his Son. Before the throne, before the throne, my Savior stands. His blood atone, His blood atone for sinful man. is reconciled his pardoning voice I hear he owns me for his child I can no longer fear or as my soul arise and God from guilty fear the bleeding sacrifice and by the heaven before the throne before the throne, my Savior stands. His blood atoned, His blood atoned for sinful man. You guys stay standing as we read this morning scripture I mean this evening scripture the scripture that you should read morning and evening stay standing do I have all of it yeah you have okay it. okay cool <laughs> therefore I therefore a prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing one an, with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you are called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for this work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Let's pray together. Jesus, tonight.
Tonight we celebrate that, as Chris said, you are the most generous being in all of the universe. And God, we celebrate that you not only gave us all that you had, but you gave us yourself. At the incarnation, when God, you left the comforts of heaven and the person of Jesus to come and dwell on the earth, to be a humble servant, to die a criminal's death, the atonement of our sins, everyone who would believe. God, here it is a Sunday, the day that you rose from the grave victorious. And so it is that all over the world, your church is gathered to proclaim the good news of the gospel, to remember the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to hear from your word, to fellowship with your family. God, tonight is a special night as we gather with the whole world to remember your good work. God, as we peer into your word now, I pray that you would speak it into our hearts, that this would be more than a slick sermon, an entertaining time, but this would be a time where the living word of God takes root in our hearts and you transform us, God. You change us more and more into your likeness. So, Lord, we devote this time to you. We pray that you would do a good work in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can grab a seat. So glad you guys are here. What a fun night. It was a great morning. I went home, took a nap. Went on a bike ride. Well, I watched my son ride a bike. I rode my mobility scooter. I still have my broken foot here. And uh, it's so much fun to come back and worship with you guys for the 6 o'clock. If you're new, my name is Gavin, one of the pastors of City Light Church. And uh, so glad you're here. Bailey, thanks for reading our text this morning. If uh, the rest of us would turn in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. That's going to be our text for this morning. And if you have a blue Bible, one of our City Light Bibles lying around, that's going to be on page 977. If you don't own a Bible, we have one for you. It's free. It's our present. Take it home. Uh, They're the white Bibles in the foyer. Just grab one on your way out. Uh, As you turn there, let me ask, how many of you guys knew that Thursday was uh, Customer Appreciation Day for Jimmy John's? Anyone hear about that? Raise your hand if you got some Jimmy John's on Thursday. Yeah. Chris texted me about 8 a.m. and said, hey, man, $1 Jimmy John's from 11 to 3. Be blessed, brother. And I thought, what a good, what a good dude to remind me that it was Customer Appreciation Day. So Thursday, I was actually at a Starbucks um, doing some study, kind of prepping for uh, this Sunday, working on my sermon. And I had a great seat because I was on the 72nd Street Starbucks so I could see across the street to the Jimmy John's out the window. So I kind of forgot about the whole deal and then about 11 o'clock I looked out the window and the line was wrapped around the building twice and then all the way out to Farnham Street. I thought, whoa, that's a long line. But I I thought, you know what, this is brilliant. I can observe the line and at about 1 o'clock, 1.30 when it dies down past the lunch rush, I'll go over and get my $1 Jimmy John sub. Some of you are nodding your heads. You know where this is going. One o'clock came and what happened? The line was still longer, right? I thought, well, you know what? The bagel, it's still sticking to the ribs. I can stick it out. We're going we're gonna to give it some more time. Surely no one's eating lunch at like 2.30. So I wait until 2.30. By this time, I'm highly caffeinated, not a lot of food and carbs. So I'm like doing the shaky thing. Like I got to eat something and quit getting coffee refills. And so it's 2.30, 2.45. I look out the window. The line is no short. Shorter. And I thought, that is insane. Omaha is so cheap, you people, right? I thought, wait, I have been stalking the line for three hours. Wait, I am so cheap. I went home and microwaved some uh, leftover lasagna. But the point of that story is I want to ask, why was that line so long for so long? The reason why is all of us in our hearts, deep down, are consumers, right? We want to know, hey, what's, what's like the least that I can contribute to something to get the most out of it? So to a consumer, a $1 9-inch Jimmy John's sub of delicious awesomeness is fantastic, right? One buck, what's one divided by nine? That's a cheap inch, right? Those are cheap bites of really good Jimmy John's. We're all consumers. And That's really fine. The problem is, for many people, that's the same way we view the church as consumers. See, we view the church as a a business, as an organization that produces religious goods and services and ourselves as consumers of it. And we want to know, what is the least I can put in to get the most out of it, right? Right? We think of it like any other business. And so I go to Applebee's to get my salmon salad lunch. I go to my church to get a good sermon, a service, and some nice programs for my kid, right? 
But the text that Bailey read this morning in Ephesians chapter 4, we get a very different picture of the church. Not as an institution that we consume from, but as a family that we participate in and contribute to. Chapter 4, verse 6 says that we have one God and Father over all. What does that mean but that we're a family? We're in this together, brothers and sisters. We participate as a family. And in a family, you don't ask, at least not my family, it would not go well for me if I asked, what's the minimum contribution I can make to just like keep the kids alive and the house from going into foreclosure, right? What's the least I can do to just like not have CPS called? It doesn't work like that, right? In a family, you say, man, how can I keep us healthy? How do I make sure my kids are thriving? How can I invest in my marriage? How can I lay my life down so that we together are doing well, are growing and thriving? That's the picture we get this morning in this passage on the church. Uh, the title that I've given to tonight's message is Enemies on Parade and Gifts in the Church. You're going to see where I got that as we get going. Enemies on Parade and Gifts in the Church. And as we study through our 16 verses uh, that the Lord has for us tonight, I just want all of us to ask the question, okay, God, how is it that I view the church? Am I a consumer trying to get everything I can out with the least amount I can put in, or am I a contributing family member? Do I serve? Do I give? Do I participate? And I think this message is important for us as a church and as individuals. Here's why. Here's what's at stake for us. City Light is a fun church. The past bit of time has been awesome, but did you guys realize we have not even had our first birthday yet? And what that means is even today we are still creating the culture that's going to define this church for a long time. You guys, we are the nucleus, right? The DNA that we put in place now is likely going to be the DNA that the Lord builds on and this church grows on for hopefully generations and generations. And, and as I study this passage, I've been praying all week, like God Use this sermon to shape us to be the kind of church that you want us to be. Would you fill City Light, City Light with people that love Jesus, that celebrate the gospel, and that lay down their lives for a greater purpose? That realize, you know what, our days are short. I'm going to invest myself in something that lasts for eternity. I want people to come into City Light and go, that is a freaky, weird culture of generosity and love that those people have. When I walk in the door, people are there to serve me. They're engaged with me, right? They care about me. They invite me into their homes and in their city group. I pray that God would shape that in us as a culture before the die is cast, before uh, the clay hardens while we're still soft. Additionally, I think there's a lot at stake for each one of us. As we're going to see in the last three or four verses of our text this morning, being involved in community, in the church community, is actually one of the primary ways that God shapes us and matures us as followers of Jesus. He uses his word and he uses his spirit, yes, but, but one of his primary means is the church community to shape us to look more like Jesus, to experience him in new and deeper ways. And so there's a lot at stake this morning, or tonight. That's why I've been praying, God, use this message. All right, we're going to jump into our 16 verses for today. Let me give you kind of my outline where we're headed so you kind of have the roadmap of where we're going. I, I want to look at three things, and really I just want to follow Paul's logic through the verses. And the first thing he does is he gives his appeal. He says, this is how you should live and interact in church community, right? This is the what. Do this. Second thing he does is he gives us the, the motivation and the means, in other words, the how. How are we supposed to live this out? And the last thing he does, he gives us the fruit of that. He gives us the result of that. So number one, what is the appeal? What is the what? What are we supposed to do? I want to read uh, with you our first six verses. And as I do, keep in mind, this is Paul writing to a church about the church, right? Paul is writing to a particular church, the church in Ephesus, and he's telling them how to interact with each other. And so it should be pretty easy for us to apply as City Light Church, right? This is going to be uh, pretty palatable, pretty, what do you, pretty powerful for us, right? It's going to be direct application. So let's read together, starting in verse 1. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, he was literally in jail, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. 
Now I want to pause right there before he gets into the, 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 the descriptors. This isn't in my notes, but I, I really wanted to point this out. You might be thinking worthy, live a life worthy of the calling, right? Pastor Chris was just preaching like two weeks ago about how we're not worthy, right? This whole Ephesians 2, 8, 9 thing that we are saved by grace, that it's because we're unworthy that we need grace. So why is Paul telling us to live a life that's worthy? Well, notice the tense of the words that he uses in here. He says, live a life worthy of the manner um, uh, to which you have been called. He's saying, now that you have been called to salvation by grace, now that you've been called into the family of God when you weren't worthy, right? Now that your salvation is sealed and done by the person work of Jesus, he did it for you. In light of that, live a life that's worthy of the Lord. Live a life that reflects what Jesus has done for you, right? So I just want to make the aside, listen, the gospel is the end to all merit, but it's not the end to all muscle. The gospel puts an end to all earning. Jesus did all the earning for us, but it doesn't put an end to all effort. We still walk with the Lord. We strive ahead. We say, you know what, by God's grace, I'm going to live a life worthy of the calling that he's called me to. That sermon was for free. Now we go on. Verse 2, he says, here's how we live in community. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. That's the, that's the what. That's what he's calling us to. He gives us a number of descriptors to say, hey, this is how you should live in church community. And I want to ask you, are these descriptors primarily... Um, Consumer language, or is this family language? Look at those descriptors. He says, we are to interact with humility. In other words, we aren't to be proud and arrogant towards other people. We aren't to compare and compete with one another, but with humility. Additionally, he says, with gentleness. In other words, we're not supposed to be harsh and demanding of each other, but we are gentle with each other. He says, with patience. In other words, we're, we're not easily irritable or agitated, right? But we patiently interact with each other. He says, bearing with one another in love. What does it mean to bear with? It means to stick it out. It means even when you tick me off, I'm not going to walk away. In love, I'm going to bear with you. Even when I annoy you, even when our personalities clash, we're going to bear with one another in a patient love. We're going to walk through a season together of life. He says, eager to maintain the unity in the spirit and the bond of peace. He says that we should be eager, right? Like, like I'm eager for the Husker game to get here, right? I can't wait to see it. I'm, I'm eager for Christmas. I, I'm anticipating it. He says we should have an eagerness to maintain the unity. Like, God, give me opportunities to bless someone. Give me an opportunity to speak highly of someone. Give me an opportunity to maintain the peace, right? We are to be eager to maintain the unity. Now, I don't know about you, but that's not the way I act in a consumer environment, right? Not at all. When, when I go into the Verizon store, I don't know why it is with cell phone stores, but there's always like a really long line. I walk into the Verizon store on Dodge, and you can just sense the elevated blood pressure of everyone in the room. Because you have to wait like 30 minutes to see a customer service representative. And people are not eagerly maintaining the unity of the Spirit, right? Right? They're doing their best to not get upset and walk out or hurt somebody because we're a consumer in that environment, right? It's not the way it's supposed to be in the church. You know where I'm the worst consumer is in a restaurant. I don't know why this is, but since I was a little kid, I just drink a lot of whatever I'm drinking whenever I eat. So now it's Diet Coke. So I take like one bite of my Philly sandwich and I feel this impulse to chase it down with like six drinks of Diet Coke. So it's like a half glass of Diet Coke per bite. And so I'm two bites into my sandwich, and my Diet Coke is empty, and I immediately feel stuck because I'm like, well, I can't take that next bite of the sandwich because I need more Diet Coke to chase it down with, right? But my sandwich is getting cold, and so I take my empty glass, and I put it on the end of the table where the waitress can see it, and I just kind of give her the look, like, how many times are you going to walk by that before you refill it, right? Because I can't eat my Philly until you give me more Diet Coke. 
Why? Because I'm a consumer. I paid $6 for that Philly and $3 for the Diet Coke. It better not run dry. I am not a patient person because I am a consumer, right? But this language doesn't sound like that. In fact, it's the opposite of that. It sounds like a family. That we're there to serve one another, bear with, eagerly find opportunities to keep the peace. In my house, in my family, I don't dare look at my empty glass of water and then just stare at my wife like, Sarah, when, when are you going to get to that? Really? How many times are you going to look at my cup before you go get the pitcher out the fridge and get me some water, right? How would that go for me in my household? She's going to look at me like I'm crazy, right? Sleeping on the couch that night. In a family, it doesn't work like that. In a family, you get up and say, honey, I'm going to get some water. Can I get you something while I'm up, Right? Why? Because in a family, there's no waiter and waited upon, right? There's one family, one house. We have one last name. We have one checking account. We have one dining room table. We're in this together. And so we serve each other. Paul's saying this is the way it's supposed to be in the household of God. Verses 4, 5, and 6 say the same thing. It says, listen, there's one body that we belong to. That's the church. There's one spirit, one hope. One Lord, we're all following the same dude. There's one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. That makes us family. He's saying, listen, we're in this together. We're on the same team. We're a family. And so we stick it out. We seek unity. We don't bail when we don't feel like our needs are getting met. We don't live like consumers trying to squeeze the church out of everything that it has. Instead, we we get up, we get some water, and we offer someone else, what can I get you? We're family. We're in this together. Very practically, what this means for us is I want to encourage everyone in here, find a church home, plug in, and ask, how can I help? Uh, if you're visiting City Light Church, we would love for this to be your church home. If it's not a good fit, that's fine too, but land in a good church. Make sure they preach the Bible. Make sure they preach Jesus at the gospel message. His life, death, burial, and resurrection is the sole hope and message of the church. And make sure, that, make sure that Jesus is the Lord of your life and not their leadership, right? That's when it gets weird, right? Follow us. We want to be the Lord of your life. Jesus is Savior. Jesus is Lord. The Bible is our book. The gospel is our message. You find that church and you plug in. You say, how can I help? How can I contribute? Who can I have over into my home to encourage with a meal? Where can I plug in? What are the needs? How can I maintain the unity of the church? How do I seek unity? I want all of us to ask, is that your attitude towards God's family? What about you? Are you a consumer asking, what can I get out of this thing? Or are you a contributing family member saying, how can I serve? What are the needs? What is the role that God has for me to play? That's point one. That's the what. Serve, be generous, lay your life down. But the danger if we start, or if we stop right here, is that this will become a list of do's and don'ts. You know what that's called? Religion, right? If we stop right here with a new list of rules, serve the church, give your life away, be generous, be kind, what we end up with is obedience-based religion that says, do more, try harder, and if you do, God will approve of you. But that's not where Paul stops. See, he goes on. He doesn't just tell us what to do. He doesn't just give us the instructions. He goes on to give us the motivation and the means to live it out. He takes us back to the gospel. He says, let's talk about Jesus and your heart for a minute, and let that be the motivation of how you serve in the church. Look with me at verses 7 through 12, at the means and the motivation. He says, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. So after telling us what to do, he says, now let's talk about Jesus for a minute. Let's talk about the gospel and our motivation for how we interact in the church. Verse 8 says that he descended. That's referring to Jesus' incarnation. 
that Jesus, the second member of the Trinity, has existed in heaven for eternity past with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. But when we were alienated from a holy God because of our sin, Jesus humbled himself and he descended, he incarnated, he became man. He was born as a helpless baby to a teenage mom who was unmarried, engaged to a blue-collar carpenter dad in a rural part of an obscure part of the world. He humbled himself and became a baby. Jesus got low for you and for me. He gave his life as a servant. He swung a hammer and and paid his rights until he was 30 when he started his humble ministry of being a homeless traveling preacher where he, he gave his life away to care for sick people, to meet their tangible needs, to preach the good news of the kingdom. He literally washed poop from his followers' feet to show them, listen, I came to humble myself. I descended to be humble, to bear with you. Paul says the reason that we're humble with each other is because Christ has been humble towards us. The reason we get low to serve one another and not lord ourselves over each other is because Jesus, God himself, humbled himself to be near to us. And he says he didn't just descend, but also that he descended into the lower regions of the earth. That's Christ's burial. He said he didn't just come to live on the earth, he went one step deeper, and he died. And for three days, his body laid in the lower regions in a tomb, and he tasted death so that his followers wouldn't have to. Why do we patiently bear with one another? Because Jesus has patiently bared with our nonsense. And even when we were sinful, messy, alienated from God, Jesus drew near to serve us. When we had incurred a debt of sin that we could never pay off, Jesus said, I will pay the price for you by being buried in a grave and tasting and overcoming death for you. See, Jesus doesn't just say, serve the church, give your life away. He says, first realize how I've humbled myself for you. Let that bring you a great joy and then mirror that grace and affection towards other people. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on. There's additionally in verse 8 a beautiful picture of the gospel. This was a kind of a mystery to me until I did some homework this week. I didn't know what this verse meant. I'll just confess that until I really dug in this week. And now it's like one of my favorite pictures of the gospel. Look again at verse 8 with me. He's quoting from the Old Testament, Psalm 68. And he says, when he ascended on high, that's when he was raised from the grave, he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. That's kind of a mysterious verse, isn't it? Am I the only one who didn't get that? Make me feel a little better about my Bible study. I, I, I had to dig and I had to read some commentaries and, and as I read some dudes that are smarter than me that had insight in the Old Testament, I thought, that is amazing. Here's what I learned. In Psalm 68, he's quoting from the life of David, and in the the setting was a battle. And in ancient times, when, when a leader of an army would go into battle and he would defeat the enemy army, what he would do in the wake of his victory is he would capture the enemy military leaders alive. And if he could, he would capture their king, and he would make them his captives. And then he would parade them back to his own capital city, and he would march them down main street in cages. Why did he lead a host of captives? He was telling his people, listen, you don't need to fear these guys anymore. We got them. He was saying, listen, we win. We stand victorious. And verse 8 becomes a picture of the gospel saying that when Jesus rose from the grave, he made a public declaration to the people of God that the enemies of God have been defeated. He's saying, we got them. Listen, you don't need to fear the enemies of God anymore. Sin, Satan, and death have been defeated in the incarnation and the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus wins. Very practically, what does that mean? That means cancer can't destroy a believer because Jesus destroyed death. We're not afraid of death. It means financial ruin can't ruin a follower of Jesus because our hope is eternal and secure in heaven. It means the devil might tempt you, but he can't wreck you because the plan of the devil was wrecked when Jesus came and died as a substitute on the cross. Amen? Amen. If I'm preaching good, say something. Chris told you you had to get going tonight. The ultimate slap in the face to sin, Satan, and death is going to be on that last day when Jesus Christ returns. We all get up out of the grave and start singing worship songs to Jesus. 
Amen? Amen. Sin, Satan, and death have been destroyed. We don't need to be afraid anymore. He's led a host of captives when he got up out the grave and said, I'm going to take you with me someday. And he says, so this whole church thing, I want you guys to get along, and I want you guys to love each other, and I want you guys to meet each other's needs because you are a saved people. You have received so much generosity and so much grace from God, you can freely give it away to each other because Christ gave it to you. He gives us the gospel as our motivation for how we are to love and serve the bride of Christ, the church. He doesn't just give us a new motivation, though, and a new heart in the gospel. He, always, he also gives us some very practical means. It says in verse 7 that he gave gifts to his people according to the measure of the grace of Christ. Additionally, in verse 8, he says he got up out the grave, he ascended, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. What this is talking about is spiritual gifts. And the idea very simply is this. When you put your faith in Jesus, you receive the Holy Spirit inside of you, and with him comes gifts. Very simply, abilities that God has given every one of his child, children, to love and serve the church, to participate in ministry. And if you've trusted in Jesus, listen, you have a gift. Verse 7 says he's given gifts to every one of us. All of us have gifts. You might have several gifts. You might have gifts that are off the chains. You might have a very simple gift, but all of us have a role to play. All of us have a gift to bring to the table. Now, you might be wondering, so what is my gift? How do I figure out what my gift is? Well, the Bible gives us some lists. of They're not exhaustive lists, but they give us some lists of what these gifts are. They're in places like 1 Corinthians 12, uh, Romans chapter 12, and I've made a list just to give you an idea of what some of these gifts are. It says some of the gifts are wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, discernment, teaching, service, administration, that's not mine, encouragement, giving, leadership, mercy, hospitality, tongues or languages, prophecy, and evangelism. This is not even an exhaustive list. What Jesus is saying is like a beautiful mosaic. I've given each one of you a unique unique personality and a unique ability, and when you come together and you serve in your giftedness, the body of Christ is built up And it goes out on mission to love and serve the city and the nation that God has us in and all over the world. Now, when I was a new Christian, I was kind of wondering, now, which one of these is mine? Like, how, how do I find out? Well, if you're wondering the same thing, there's all kinds of gifts and assessment tools that you can fill out, little bubble sheet, like the cat tests. You remember the cat tests back in the day? Was that, do we still do cat tests? Did you do new? I don't know. You guys are not, help me out. Do we do cat tests anymore? Still do cat tests. It's like bubble sheets. You can figure out your gifts. And all those are great. You can even Google search like spiritual gift assessment. You'll probably find something helpful. But I want to share with you some great advice I got when I was a brand new Christian. Uh, There was an older Christian who said, Gavin, um, here's how you figure out your spiritual gifts. You just grow in your own walk with the Lord. You read your Bible. You pray. You devote yourself to Jesus. And then you plug into a good, healthy church. And you just start doing stuff. Just serve. Just see what the needs are and sign up for everything that you can. Just serve the mission and ministry of the church. And he said, you're going to find that some things you do completely flop, right? You're going to make things worse rather than better, and they're going to be frustrating, and you're not going to get joy. That's probably not a spiritual gift. He said, other things you're going to do are going to bless people. People are going to say, hey, that was really helpful. I'm glad that you did that. That met a need. Additionally, you're going to get some joy from that. You're going to say, I kind of enjoyed doing that. That was fun. I like that. And in doing so, you're going to figure out what your gift is to serve in ministry, as we're all called to give ourselves in ministry. Now, to a consumer, they might be thinking, wait a second, you just said we do ministry? Like, I thought that's what you do, because you're the paid professional, right? You're the pastor. You're the guy in the pulpit, right? Pastors do ministry, and we come and listen to your sermons and write a check, right? That's why we pay you the big bucks to do the ministry. Well, is that what Scripture says? Let's look again at verses 11 and 12. It says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the shepherds and teachers. In short, these are 
These are people who start churches, who lead churches, who preach and teach at churches, who have a passion for lost people and train people to share their faith, people who speak the word of God and see sin and speak truth into the church to build it up. Why did God give the church these kind of people? To equip the saints, that's all of us who have trusted a Christ, for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Listen, all of us have been called to full-time ministry. Doesn't matter what your vocation is, doesn't matter what your occupation is, God has put a calling on your life for ministry. You are called to contribute to the ministry and mission of the church. Very practically, God has given you something to bring to the table. And I want to encourage you to figure out what that is. Very simply, just start doing some stuff. Just don't do nothing, all right? That's how you're going to start to figure it out. Don't do nothing, do something. Tweet that out. That's brilliant, right? Just start serving. Don't consume. You could open up your home to a new couple or a new friend that you meet at church. You could open up your house and share a meal with your neighbors. You could try to lead a Bible study. You could bake some cookies for some friends who are going through a hard time and encourage them. You can pray for them. You could invite your neighbors to church. You could serve in a Sunday morning or Sunday night role. You could serve with City Light kids. You could uh, throw a Halloween party in your backyard and throw a bonfire, invite all of your neighbors over. You could tell a family member about Jesus. You could pick up trash in the lawn. Just don't do nothing, right? And as you serve, you're going to see that some stuff really blesses the church and is really beneficial, and you get joy out of it, and some stuff is going to flop, and you're going to say, you know what? This is my gift. This is where I serve. Let the gospel of Jesus motivate you and let the gifts of Jesus empower you to give your life and serve in ministry. Last point, the last four verses of our scripture today are going to show us the result. When we serve in the church, when we experience the gospel and pay forward that grace into each other's lives, here's what he says starting in verse 13. Remember verse 12, he said, he gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Here we go, verse 13 until we attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children. In other words, we grow up, no longer tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, that's the church, is joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly. That's each one of us. It makes the body grow so that, build, so that it builds itself up in love. Paul's final point is that when, when, you, when you serve the church and when you don't consume from the church, but you see yourself as a participatory family member, when you're empowered by the gospel and you're using your gifts, you mature. You start to grow in Christ. God actually uses that to do a work in your own heart to grow you in your faith. Additionally, the church is built up and matures and, and lives out the mature form that God had intended it to be. The idea here is very simple. It's that just like when we're born physically, we're born infants, right? Ain't nobody ever came out an eight-year-old. That would be painful for mom. How do we come out? Infants, right? Additionally, when we're born again, when we become Christians, without any exception, no matter what your biological age is, spiritually we are born infants. And Paul says you're not supposed to stay that way. You're supposed to mature. You're supposed to grow. Don't stay a spiritual infant. Why shouldn't we stay infants? Why is that bad? Well, let me um, just pull some analogies from a biological infant. That's low-hanging fruit for me since I have a three-week-old at home. Let me give you three observations of a biological infant that I think applies to spiritual infancy and why we should not stay there. Observation number one, infants are insanely self-centered. My son Levi Thomas is three weeks old. He has no idea that there's other human, in, other human beings in the world that have needs besides him, right? What he knows is what he needs when he needs it and the fact that he wants it now. And if he doesn't get it, he's going to scream. He doesn't care if it's 3 a.m. like it was this morning and dad had to preach the next day. He wants it now, right? He is self-centered. Listen, when we're born again, it doesn't make us any less Christian, but we're very spiritually self-centered, right? 
It's all about me, right? And so we walk into a church community as a new Christian, and we don't even see the needs of the people around us, right? We're just thinking, okay, am I going to get something out of this? Is this going to be weird? I'm better sit by the back just in case they start speaking in tongues or doing something I'm uncomfortable with, and I'm going to bounce out the back door, right? And and is someone going to talk to me? What are they going to think about me, right? And it's all about me. But as you invest yourself in a church community, it starts to become about other people. As you mature, you walk into a church and, and you start to think, man, that's a new person. I need to encourage them and shake their hand, right? You start to notice the needs of the people around you, and you start to minister to their needs and serve them. We start to mature and grow up. Second observation of a biological infant, they are insanely unstable. Here's what I mean. My son has no attention span. Let me give you a glimpse into like a 30-second window of his life. It kind of goes like this. I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm mad, I pooped, where's the milk? I'm asleep. That's a 30-second cycle. He is unstable. Spiritually speaking, we start the same way. Verse 14 says it. It says, don't remain a child so that you're tossed to and fro. What does that mean? It means you're unstable. It means winds can come and they, and they shake you, right? It means you listen to a sermon and you think, praise the Lord, I got four points of application I'm going to live out this week, right? And then you get out to your car and you've already forgotten and you're spiritually ADD and you think, this is a good jam. Squirrel, how about that? What am I doing this week? Homework tonight, right? We've forgotten. We're tossed to and fro. There's no stability. As we invest in and remain in a church community, we hear the word of God preached every week, right? When we first start off, we think, I'm going to read the whole Bible like this week. And we get through Leviticus, right? And then we just go into a sleep coma for a month because we were pushing so hard. And then we don't touch our Bible for four months after that, right? And then we pick it up and feel guilty and we try again and we're unstable, right? But as you hear the Word of God preached, as you participate in a Bible study or a city group, you have some Christian friends, you encourage each other. Hey, what are you hearing from the Lord? Here's here's what God's been teaching me. How can I pray for you? How are you doing in your walk? You develop a pattern of consistency. You have stability. You're no longer tossed to and fro. Third observation of of a biological infant. My son, Levi Thomas, has no idea what is good for him. In other words, my son can't discern the difference between breast milk and cyanide, right? It doesn't matter. If you put it in his mouth, he will swallow it. He's not independent. He doesn't know what he should eat. He can't discern it, right? Spiritually speaking, verse 14 says the same thing. It says, as spiritual babies, we are carried about by every wind of doctrine. In other words, when you're a brand new Christian... You know that Jesus saved you, your faith is in him, his spirit abides in you, but you don't know your way around the Bible, right? And you get some dude that shows up your, at your door in a white shirt and some, some dated black pants that are a little bit too short, and you think, maybe Mormonism's a good idea. I don't know, let's look at some verses, right? And then some dude shows up with like a watercolored pamphlet, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and you think, maybe that's a good idea. I should look into that, right? You read a funky website with poor design and awkward music about some end times nonsense, and you think, yeah, maybe Jesus has returned, and his name is Chris Haruska, you know, and I should drink the Kool-Aid, right? You don't know. You are carried about by every wind of doctrine, every craftiness of man. You don't know what's a good idea because you're not rooted in sound Christian doctrine. What the church has believed over the span of the last 2,000 years is the people of God collectively have studied the word of God and established the Christian orthodoxy. We need the church and people around us to help us navigate our Bibles. Understand basic Christian teaching. Put some roots down so that every whack job, nut job idea doesn't sound good to us anymore. I've been a Christian for 15 years right now. I'm not wondering if Mormonism is right, right? You develop some consistency. You're not tossed to and fro. Paul says as we mature out of spiritual infancy, we do so as we invest in the local church, as we root ourselves in the family of God. And he says as we do this, we grow up. Look at the verses again with me. He says in verse 13 that we grow into mature manhood. Verse 14 says that we are no longer children. 
Verse 15 says that we grow up into Christ. Verse 16 says that as each one of us does our part, that the whole body, the whole church itself, grows. What this means very practically is, listen, there is no room for you to say, I'm going to grow by myself, I just got to work on me. It does not work like that. Yes, you need to read your Bible. Yes, you need to devote yourself to growing with Jesus. Yes, you need to have a personal relationship with God. But listen, you don't have a private relationship with God. There's no such thing. It's personal, but it's not private. It's to be lived out in the context of community. Community kind of works like a mirror. If you think about it, I have no idea what I look like until I look in a mirror. And then I go, oh, that's what I look like. I'm sorry for everybody who has to look at me, right? We go, oh no, that's what I look like. I better put some gel or some product in that hair. But I didn't know until I looked in the mirror, right? Community works like that too for our character. We don't even know what we look like until we step into community. As I think about my own relationship with God, um, I've, I've been a Christian for about 15 years now, almost half of my life. And And, you know, from an early day, I really had a passion for the Word of God, and I was reading through the Bible quickly, and I was learning all sorts of truths that I thought I knew, but I found out later that I I, I only knew about it abstractly. In other words, I, I read in my Bible verses like we read today, that we should bear with one another, that we should be patient towards each other. So I thought, well, I really, I know that, right? But I didn't really know how to apply that until I got in community with people who were relationally difficult, right? And I thought, oh, now I understand what it means to bear with one another, to patiently walk with one another. I read verses like, I'm an ambassador for Christ, and I'm always supposed to be prepared to give reason for the hope that I have in me. And so I thought I understood that, but it wasn't until I was in a church community where I sat down with someone who actually taught me how to memorize some verses, how to, in an organized way, articulate my faith in Jesus. Right? I read the verse, I learned it in the Bible, but I learned how to live it out in the context of community. I read in the Bible that I'm supposed to love my wife as Christ loves the church, and I thought that I understood that, but in college I had dinner once a week with an older couple in the church, and I got to see it lived out with flesh on the bones of the truth. See, I learned the truth in the Word of God, but I saw it expressed and modeled in the community of God. As we invest in the community of God, God starts to mature us. We start to grow up. We don't know how to handle conflict. We don't know how to forgive each other until we actually get messy, right? Until things get hard. That's when we learn how to bear with, how to forgive. Additionally, in my own story, is through the church that I started to learn about my spiritual gifts and how God has shaped me. I remember I was at a um, an, another large church in the city when I was in college. And uh, last week I talked about how I'm not really a guitar player. I'm more of a guitar owner, if you remember that. And since I was a guitar owner and could like strum the three Christian chords, uh, they asked me at the big church to lead worship one time when the worship leader was gone. So I thought, this is fantastic. So I put together a nice little band and we practiced and I thought it was pretty good. We had a pretty good morning. And then I was kind of waiting for the email like, hey, can you do that again? I never got that email. You know, the worship leader went out of town again, but no one ever asked me. They like flew some guy in, right? They didn't ask me anymore. I started to realize, oh, okay, maybe that's not my fit, right? Maybe that's not where I belong. Additionally, I remember in being involved in a college ministry, there were two different people in the same year who had lost parents, and we were young, like 19, 20 years old. And God really burdened my heart for for these people, and so I took them out to coffee, and, and, and I had written down some verses, and I just wanted to encourage these people going through a rough time. One by one, I take them out, and, and, and I'm doing my best to give them some verses, pray with them, ask them how they're doing. It was the most awkward conversation of my life. I just had no natural sense of what to ask or what to say, so it was like, so your dad died. Yeah. Like, how, are you sad? They're like, is this really happening, right? Here, I bought you a latte. Here's a verse. Let's pray, right? And I kind of realized through trial and error, maybe mercy is not like the main thing I bring to the table. That might not be my number one spiritual gift. 
But that same year, the college pastor had to leave town, and he asked me if I would preach the Bible. And it was in the book of James. And I thought, well, I'm 0 for 2, so sure, let's try something else, right? And I got out my Bible, I put some notes together, and I gave a sermon that was so-so out of the book of James. And people that night said, Gavin, I never really understood that passage, but when you communicated it, it really helped bring it to light. And I feel like God spoke to me tonight. And I thought, huh, well, that was not so bad, right? Maybe I do have something to offer. I realized maybe I have a teaching gift to teach the Word of God. Additionally, in college, I remember... Um, through a connection that I had with some apartments in our city that, that I kind of got this vision of like, hey, what if I moved into these ghetto apartments that I have a connection with? Um, they were filled with prostitutes and gangbangers and violence. There had been multiple shootings and car thefts. What if I, I'm going to live somewhere in college, right? And I'm not married. I don't have kids. What if I moved in there to be a light in a really dark place in our city? And so I did. I got a roommate who was as crazy as I was, and we moved in. And the first night we were there, I watched a guy get shot right out my window. Kind of an awakening moment for those scared white kid from a small town, right? Like, whoa, that didn't happen in Waverly. And a couple weeks later, my Jeep got stolen, and it was quite the cultural immersion experience. But, but what we invited some other Christian college students to move in with us, and we started to walk the halls and pray for the people that lived there. And we started to host backyard Bible clubs for the little kids. And all the little hood rats would come out. We'd do Bible stories and teach them Jesus songs and funny little dances and give them popsicles. And then we got some meat donated and we started hosting some barbecues. And, and the neighbors slowly started to come out and engage with us. And by the time I moved out of that apartment, 19 Christian college students had moved in with me to live there. Additionally, we started seeing people come to Jesus, people get plugged into our various churches, and the whole kind of ethos, the whole environment of this part of the city started to change. And I realized, man, maybe God has gifted me to like start new stuff. Like when I have an idea and I cast a vision, like people kind of rally around that. Maybe my gift is to start new things. See, it was in community through trial and error, I realized, okay, that flopped, that helped, right? So go there. Do this, don't do that. And it was through community that I started to learn about my character, right? How about you? Do you have the mirror of community in your life? See, we don't know that we're an overbearing personality, right, until our city group leader lovingly says, you know, Gavin, why don't you, like, let Janet talk every now and then? Like, what if you ask more questions instead of told so many stories and you go, oh, that's like a mirror. I need to chill out and quit talking so much, right? We go, well, I didn't realize I was proud until that really cocky guy started coming to my city group, right? And all of a sudden, his arrogance really started to rub me wrong. Why is that guy so proud and cocky? And I realized, oh, maybe the reason his ego bugs me so much is because there's not room for both of our egos in the same room, right? Maybe I'm threatened by his personality. Jesus, you showed me my pride through community, right? We don't realize that Jesus needs to work on us towards generosity until we actually have the experience of writing out a check, right? I remember with each raise that I've, the few that I've had in my life, when the income goes up, I go, whoa, 10% of that seems like a lot, right? And it's like, Spirit of God, I didn't realize how I needed you to work in my heart till generosity until I actually wrote a tithe check. Until I started to be generous with the people and the needs around me. See, community works like a mirror that Jesus uses to expose our heart and to grow us, to mature us into manhood. And as we all commit ourselves, as we all lovingly give ourselves towards each other, the whole body, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ is grown up into what she's supposed to look like. Before I pray for us tonight, I just want to ask you one more time to consider your own heart. How do you view the church? Are you a consumer of the church, or do you contribute to the family of God? Some of us tonight probably need to repent and do business with Jesus for viewing the church, the bride of Christ, as an Applebee's that we get some religious goods and service out of. Others might need to repent of, of serving the church faithfully for a really long time, but for all the wrong reasons, right? Thinking that somehow we're going to earn God's approval and favor because we are good church people. But the scripture told us tonight... We serve the church because we already have God's approval, because of the person and work of Jesus. Let me ask you, how do you need to respond to the word of God tonight? City Light, let me just say to you, you are an absolute miracle of God's grace. 
Any church that holds true to the Bible, preaches the gospel, loves people, brings people to the foot of the cross that is growing, where people are meeting Jesus, is an absolute miracle. And I want every one of you to know that the church is a gift to you, and you are a gift to the church. If you've trusted Christ, he's put a gift inside of you. The Holy Spirit dwells inside of you, and you are an amazing gift to the church. The potential that you have to live your life for Jesus is amazing. Don't sell it short. Ephesians 3.20, he can do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine by his power at work within us. Man, City Light, I want you to hear the invitation of Jesus tonight to invest yourself in the family of God where you're going to experience his grace, where you're going to have the opportunity to use the gifts that he's lovingly and graciously given you, and where you have the opportunity to grow up and mature to be more like Jesus. Let me pray that that would be true. Jesus, tonight we celebrate once again the good news of the gospel. God, we celebrate that as we read your Bible, that it's not full of do's and don'ts and just morality-based religion, but we read a message that says, done. Jesus paid it all. Thank you, Jesus, that you descended to the earth to lovingly serve us, that you descended into the grave to pay the debt and atone for our sins, and that you rose again victorious over sin, death, and the devil. God, as a church and as individuals, may we live in light of that good news. God, I pray that we would saturate our hearts and the generosity and the grace of God, and that we couldn't help but respond towards each other with humility, patience, and love. God, I pray that you would create that culture among us, that freaky, weird culture of generosity and love and patience that communicates to our city that the Spirit of God, that Jesus lives in these people. Jesus, would you do that in our hearts? In Jesus' name, amen. City Light, would you stand with me? Oh. 
creator press and worship him in humbleness oh praise him hallelujah praise praise your father praise the son You guys go ahead and be seated. Go ahead and be seated. God, we want to just worship you and say thank you, Jesus, for that word, for that moment, for this opportunity to come to you tonight and worship you. Oh, God, I love the way your word is living and active, the way that we heard from you, that we were pointed to you, that, God, uh, first and foremost, that we are a community of people that rejoice that, Jesus, you've called us, that you've called us to know you as Father and Abba King, that you've called us into your grace, that you've made your mercy known to us. Secondly, that we are people that you've given a purpose to, to use our giftings to build up the body and live for something bigger than ourselves. Oh God, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, uh, one of the people that serve every week and uh, use their gifts for our good is uh, the musicians. Could you guys give them just a real quick round of applause? We love them. We love Gabe. There's Gabe. Look at that hair. There's just something about that fro, bro. Look at that. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Hey, uh, well, first of all, I, I want to ask you guys to pull this out, uh, your programs, bulletins. If you guys have that, we're going to walk through that in just a minute. Uh, but before I, we get there, I want to just camp out on one of the things that, that Gavin said. First, he said uh, that the church should be a blessing to you, and you should be a blessing to the church. And before we just move on and get into announcements and communicating some things, uh, I just want to ask you, um, are you serving? Are you giving? Have you moved from maybe a consumer mentality into a place where you're saying, listen, I want to use my time, talent, resources for the good of others and the glory of God? Has that transfer happened in your life? And one of the ways that you can tell if that actually has is that you'll actually start serving. You actually start considering other people. And tonight I want to just say, for some of you guys, the next step in discipleship, the next step of growth, the next step where you say, Jesus, I'm going to be obedient to you, is going to say yes. Say yes. Say, yes, I'm going to start serving. I'm going to start giving. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know all my gifts. I haven't figured it all out. But just say, I'm going to start showing up to stuff. Say, Lord, I'm going to start making myself available to you. God, whatever I have, my resources, time, and talent, they're yours. And I'm going to start giving them for your kingdom and the good of others. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Let's get into it. Uh, you guys know at City Light Church, there's always, always, always new people here, and uh, we are so encouraged by what God's done to build this community, uh, but we really do value relationships with you guys. We don't want you just to remain strangers. Uh, we want to actually have a relationship and see you get uh, uh, connected to community, and so one of the things you guys could do tonight is there should be connection cards in the back of your pews or in the foyer area. Uh, would you guys do us a favor tonight? If you're new and you're saying, hey, this is going to be our church. We want to uh, fellowship here, serve here, get connected here. Would you fill out one of those connection cards tonight? Drop them in the giving box. Also, if you're saying, hey, I want to get connected to a pastor. I have some questions about this church. Um, you know, the associate pastor somehow seems to say inappropriate things on a regular basis. Request to talk to Gavin because I don't have time for that. So, um, <laughs> you know, I'm busy. Um, so, 
Uh, yeah, and then you guys drop them in there, though. If you have prayer requests, any kind of needs, drop it in there. Write a little note. We'd love to follow up and get connected with you guys. Also, you guys, there's uh, this inf- a little bit of information on city groups outside here. Um, we'd love for you to pick this up and read about them. As a church, we really do value what happens here on Sundays. We believe that the, the church should be a blessing to you. Part of the, the gathered church on Sunday morning is you hear the, uh, the word of God. It should hopefully bless you. But we also want to be a church that scatters well that goes to people that don't yet belong in this room, that don't yet attend a service or come here regularly. And uh, so that looks like in my neighborhood, I'm in a city group and uh, we're living on mission or whatever it takes like. And it's been so fun because uh, basically uh, one of my gifts is just being weird. And so um, we decided to try something uh, in our, our little neighborhood to reach our neighbors. And so we started a fire in our driveway. And um, that was our outreach last Halloween is we were going to give candy away with, and have a fire pit. And now all of my neighbors are like, there was this conversation going around in our neighborhood, like, hey, what's going on for Halloween? And everybody kept saying, hey, the Horuskas, they do this huge thing and they start a fire in their driveway. Somehow, like, fire is the new missional cool. So anyways, like, check that out. Light a fire over Halloween and, and see what happens. So anyways, but we'd love for to encourage you guys to get connected to a city group. Uh, it's been really, really fun in ours to begin to experience that family, have some of those issues that Gavin talked about, like, oh, my goodness, I don't know if I like him. Why does he keep coming to our group? We have those moments, all of us, okay? Nobody gets it. It's all right. You'll be around weird people eventually. So, um... But we'd love for you to get connected to those, begin to live on mission, begin to live on family. Uh, that'd be awesome. Also, baby dedications uh, are happening December 15th. Uh, any babies in the room? No babies. Okay, so uh, December 15th is happening. Baby dedications. Baby dedications are a two-way commitment. They're a commitment from the church saying, hey, listen, we want to bless your family. We want to walk with you and do anything we can to pray, serve, and encourage you, your kids and your family to continue to walk with Jesus. And it's a dedication from that family to say, listen, we are going to be a part of this community, walk, serve, and do everything we can in our home to make disciples of Jesus. So if uh, that's you guys, your family, December 8th, and we're going to have an informational meeting about that, the 15th. Uh, we're actually going to do baby dedication, so please email Sarah if you're interested in that. Also, Sunday morning serving teams, uh, we're starting two new teams. One of them's right in the back. Everybody turn around right now. Look at Nick Royer on that camera. Give it up for Nick Royer and his team. Hey! They are awesome. We are going to soon uh, have high def videos on our website so you can see all of this glory on your laptop on the regular. Screenshot that, save that image, make it your background. Boom. All right. So uh, that's one team is a video team. Please email again, Sarah, if you're interested in that, or you can email me. We're, uh, we're gonna, as we move to the Omar, we're going to have an entire video team, people that are just helping move cameras around, helping set up stuff. The other thing is we're going to need a setup team, people to set up chairs. You are our go-to people. Young dudes, you ain't got no kids. You can get up early, carry some chairs, all right? Listen, make something happen. Just don't do nothing. That's what the tagline is. Hashtag it, all right? Pick up some chairs and be humble like Jesus was before I say something. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to start calling you out, all right? Post it on your Facebook wall. All right. Hey, Sunday morning serving teams, if you're interested, though, please email uh, Sarah, our administrative assistant. She is on this, or you can drop it on a giving card and let us know. Lastly, City Life Church, you guys know we don't pass a plate here. Uh, we do pray that you guys would be a generous people. In my life, as I've understand more and more the gospel of what Christ has given me and understand what he's done for me and my heart has been for the loss, I want to be about the local church. I want to be about planting churches all over the city, and the reality is it takes time, talent, and resources, and so I want to give generously to the things and the work of God in our city. And so uh, if you are saying, yes, this is our church, we want to give financially and be a part of what God's doing here, do that in two ways. Give your tithes and offering in the giving box right in the back. Otherwise, you can set up your giving online at citylightomaha.org. Just hit give, and uh, you can you just follow the, the instructions there. City Light, we love you. Pray that you guys would just be a church that use your gifts for the glory of God, not just for this season, but for the rest of your lives. Every single one of you in this room, I want you to know, it doesn't matter how you're educated or your background or any of those things. God will use that stuff. But as you are, if you are empowered by the Spirit of God, God wants to use you for his glory and his kingdom. Don't be afraid to step out in faith and begin to serve and do something for his kingdom. Amen? Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for this night. We thank you for these people. And uh, we thank you first and foremost for your word. 
I thank you, God, that in your word tonight, you encouraged us and let us know that, God, we have been called to you, that we've been set free by your work, that, God, we have been redeemed by the things that Jesus Christ has done for us 2,000 years ago. And secondly, that, God, we're not just in this waiting pattern here on earth, but that you've given us gifts and given your spirit and empowered us to be a people that are actually able to serve you and be uh, used to glorify you right here in our city. Oh God, would we be a people? Would we be a church? Would City Light for hundreds of years be an organization, a church family that says, listen, we want to use everything we are for your glory and your kingdom. Oh Jesus, we love you. Amen. Thank you guys so much. We'll see you next week.